based out of the New York offices. And I just moved over from our, our London branch about uh, six months ago. And um, so today we're going to be talking about um, testing and adapting innovative approaches to workplace well-being in K through 12 education during COVID-19. Uh, apologies for the not so snappy title, um, but hopefully I'll explain a bit more about what this means. So just to start off, I thought I'd walk us through the agenda. Um, I wanted to give everyone a, a little bit of an overview into BIT, uh, which stands for the Behavioral Insights Team. And then I'm gonna walk you through some of the previous projects just to give you a sense of the kind of work that we do um, and, and some of the results that we've seen in the past. And then I'll focus a lot of our time on the Well at Work program that we're currently running, um, which has been commissioned through McConnell's Well Ahead Foundation. And then finally, I'm gonna allow for around 20 minutes of um, you all asking me questions. Um, and so I just wanted to really briefly, um, while I'm the one speaking, this is a very joint effort. So we have a project team that spans uh, continents and, and different time zones. So we have a project support team who's based out of London. Um, the two project leads are, are myself, as I said, a senior advisor, um, and then Sasha, who's actually the director of our new BIT Canada offices. And then we also have a research team who are based in London. Um, and I thought this would be a great opportunity if you are able to, in the chat box, just introduce yourself um, so that we know who's on the call and we can get familiar with each other, even though we can't see each other. So just to start out, I'll give you a little bit of a background into how the Behavioral Insights team came about and what our kind of uh, main goals and purposes are. So we are a social purpose company who started life inside of government. So in 2010, when David Cameron was prime minister in the UK, he set up a very small behavioral insights team within the prime minister's office. And that team was about 10 people. And our goal was really to try to apply behavioral insights to making public policy uh, more effective and help to in encourage positive behavior change. And I'll explain a little bit what behavioral insights mean in a second. Uh, but since then, we've opened offices, um, as you can see in 2012, we opened offices in Australia. And then in 2014, we spun out of government so that we could take on different projects uh, that are as related to government and prioritize some of our own uh, kind of social impact projects. And so now this means we're a company, a social purpose company that's one third owned by cabinet office still, a third owned by Nesta's innovation charity, and then a third owned by BIT employees. Um, and since 2014, we've really expanded quite substantially. So we opened offices in New York in 2015, which is where I'm based at the moment. We also have offices in Singapore, uh, New Zealand. Um, and as I mentioned, we just opened offices in Canada. So we've seen some pretty extensive growth, but our mission really has not changed that we are trying to um, we, we only take on projects that we feel will have a positive social impact um, and, and trying to help people make healthier, better choices for themselves. So moving on to a question that we get quite often, what are behavioral insights? This is a, a term that was coined by the behavioral insights team in 2010. And really it's just a combination of findings from psychology uh, and economics and then applying those kind of findings with to public policy. And one thing that's really important about the behavioral insights team is that whenever possible, we try to use rigorous evaluation methods so that we can see what we're testing is actually working. So a lot of times this takes form of a randomized control trial, which I'll explain in a little bit more depth later on when I'm walking through the Well at Work program. And, and what this means is that we're really trying to understand how people behave in practice so that we can better design policies and services. Uh, so I want to give you a brief flavor before jumping in again to the work that we're doing specifically in Canada on some of our previous projects. And, 
And whenever we work on projects, we uh, use a kind of framework that will help us come up with some kind of solutions. And this is called EAST. You'll, you'll learn that we love an acronym um, at the Behavioral Insights team. And to make behavior change, these are some kind of principles that we like to draw on um, easy. So uh, making, making sure that any kind of intervention that we come up with is easy as possible to use, making it attractive, making it social, and making it timely. Um, and as a little cheat sheet for you, what that really means is something is easy if it tells you exactly what you need to do um, and it gives you very clear instructions on how to do that. Um, it doesn't require a massive amount of effort or make you go out of your way to do something. We call this uh, friction cost. Um, and it gives you a clear roadmap to, to success. And one thing that we found really important is wherever possible to make things easy, try to kind of auto-complete steps or actions where possible. So filling in a form where you already have information on a, a participant or a candidate, it's much easier for them to complete that if you auto-fill it out. Um, moving on to making something attractive. So this is something that I think the, the kind of public sector does really well in marketing campaigns. but um, Anything that you send out, any kinds of communications should really call out and grab someone's attention and to kind of cut through the clutter of distraction. Um, and we try to make things as vivid and memorable as possible. And this can sometimes be trying to really personalize our interventions or our messages so people feel like it's really relevant to them and really tailored to them as well. Uh, the third thing is trying to make something social. And I think this is one of the kind of biggest components. So to make something social, it tells me what other people, especially people like me, are doing. So for example, uh, one of our very first trials that we did in the UK was uh, revising an HMRC, which is the tax body uh, in the United Kingdom, revising their letter. And all we did was include one statement that said, nine out of 10 people pay their taxes on time. And this is a true statement. Um, and we saw that this led to around 200 million in increased tax payments. So I think oftentimes people assume that other people aren't paying taxes, so why should I? But when you provide people with the information that other people are, are actually doing this behavior, they're more likely to do it themselves. Uh, and another way to make things social is to really rely on the kind of existing support networks that we have um, and, and asking people to hold you accountable. And I'll give an example of that in some of the work that we've done. And, and finally, the last thing is making something timely. So we know that um, at specific periods in our life, so at transition points, at times of crisis, um, whatever that may be when you're moving house you're you're much more likely to make a behavior change uh during these times of transition so we do try to make any of the interventions or communications that we send come at just the right moment when people need to take action um, and this really takes advantage of the tendency that it's easier to do tasks now than to postpone harder tasks for later so that's a very high level overview of the kind of East principles that we try to apply to a lot of our interventions or communications. And so to make this a little bit more concrete, I wanted to walk you through just a few examples of the, of the work that we've done in the past. Um, this one is very recent from the UK. Um, we were asked by, uh, one of the one of the bodies in the UK to look at how we could promote teacher well-being dur during COVID-19. Um, so a very relevant topic, I'm sure, for many of you. And, and what we did is very similar to the intervention and kind of dovetails off the intervention that uh, we developed with Well Ahead Foundation. So we worked, worked with the Charter College of Teaching and we launched what's called Teach Together. Uh, this is a free text messaging service to support teacher well-being under COVID-19 crisis. So in our first message, uh, over 2,000 teachers, we asked them um, how they switch off uh, in the evening. And we, re we received 300 responses. 
And the reason that we're asking teachers is that we found that it's uh, much more attractive and much more social if we're giving advice from teachers to teachers rather than trying to give them these kind of um, expert, you know, we, we try to make everything based on evidence, but I think it, it comes across as much more personal when we're actually getting advice from teachers. Um, and so from these responses, we've been sending out weekly text messages on tips and resources to promote remote teaching, but also really utilizing quotes and stories from other teachers and uh, also prompts to engage in well-being activities and also to support others. Um, so here you can just see an example of a text message that we sent initially from this Teach Together program. Um, and I, I can read it for you. Uh, we know we know what a difference we make as teachers, but that can make it hard work to switch off from work. Self-care is critical to be able to give the best of ourselves. And this came from a teacher named Stephen. Um, and again, I think it's really important that uh, this kind of storytelling aspect really normalizes the fact that we're all dealing and struggling with these challenges in our well-being. Uh, so this is an ongoing project. We don't have results yet, but I thought it was very related to the topic at hand. Um, moving on to a maybe slightly uh, less relevant topic um, that we conducted in the, in the UK doesn't specifically relate to well-being, but there are some results that I think are really interesting from this study. So we had this question of how can we increase pass rates for people who previously failed um, their final exams or GCSEs in the UK? And what we did was we conducted first a bit of explore work to really understand what were the barriers to learning that students were facing. And the things that came out were um, slightly surprising to us. So a lot of them felt that they had poor learning skills or they struggled to plan in advance. One of the biggest themes was that they didn't feel they had enough social support um, when they needed it. And a lot of these students uh, came from backgrounds where they maybe didn't really feel like they fit in or that they belonged in a um, college institution. And so taking these barriers, barriers to learning that we already knew about, we developed a series of interventions to try to increase pass rates and also increase attendance for these students. The first of which was, uh, you'll notice as we go through this, we like to use text messages a lot. Um, and I can explain and happy to answer questions during the Q&A on why this is. Um, but more generally, they're they're pretty easy to scale and they're very cost effective and they can be tailored um, quite easily as well. So uh, during this trial, we uh, sent out a few different kinds of prompts. The first was um, that messages that reinforce the belief that I can be a successful learner. So trying to boost kind of self-efficacy for those students who maybe thought that they didn't belong. The second was that my learning can be improved through effort and hard work. This draws a bit on kind of growth mindset principles. Um, and then the other one was just simple exam reminders around um, when exams are coming up. And also one of the biggest things we saw was that after break, people's attendance significantly dropped off. So we did send reminders around when, when college classes is re would resume. Um, and we saw from this that there was a 16% uh, increase in, in pass rates from these exams and based on these te text message reminders and also a 21% increase in uh, attendance based on these messages compared to the control group. And if this were had been scaled to all 1,179 students, this would have resulted in 103 extra learners having passed their final exams. Um, so this is a really good example of how something quite simple um, can actually lead to, to pretty significant changes in student outcomes. The second uh, example that I'll, I'll walk you through is, uh, again, around boosting GCSE recent passes. So this is, again, a, an exam that they have to take in the UK. Many people failed and then they have to reset in order to move on. Um, and we used uh, a lot of the work from Jeffrey Cohen, who is an academic that we've worked with uh, from Stanford. 
Uh, and we used something called values affirmation, which is essentially a very short 15 minute exercise where we prompt students to think about, uh, you can see the prompt here, uh, think about which of your personal values are important to you and write a paragraph for each value explaining why it matters to you. And the purpose of this is really to combat what we call a stereotype threat. So for some people who are uh, resitting exams, they may have had negative experiences with education in the past. And so this values affirmation intervention has been shown to decrease the feelings of threat and the feelings that you don't belong and also highlight the things that you kind of value and, and that you're good at. So it's a bit about reframing the situation and kind of building that sense of self-efficacy that you actually can do this. Um, and as you can see, what we found, this, this prompt went out four times throughout the, the year and this increased pass rates, just this simple exercise, increased pass rates by 25% just through using values affirmation four times throughout the semester. Uh, and the last example that I'll give from our previous work before moving on to the, the work that we're currently doing, again, is around um, GCSE pass rates. But I think this one is actually a, a bit more innovative and really interesting because we weren't uh, targeting the students or the learners themselves directly. What we did was we asked at the very beginning of the semester, for students to nominate someone that could be their study supporter. So this could be anyone from a grandparent, a caregiver, a friend, anyone they felt that could support them. And we asked them to provide that study supporter's um, cell phone information. And rather than texting the learner themselves, we texted that study supporter weekly messages around exam reminders, what they were learning in class, um, and other kind of motivational prompts. And the reason that we did this is that people are really willing to help their uh, their learner, but they just didn't really know how to, and they didn't know what they were learning in class, and they didn't know when exams were coming up. So by providing them with these weekly text messages, we saw an increase in conversations like the one you see here. So if we sent a text to Fatima about her friend Lena, and, and Fatima knows that Lena has an exam coming up, we saw an increase in these kind of supportive conversations around, you know, Lena, how is the revision going? And just from this, we saw that um, pass rates increased by about 27% for those people who received um, the study supporter messages compared to those who did not. So again, I think this one's a really interesting example of not intervening necessarily on the learner themselves, but drawing on that kind of social support network to make them feel like someone's holding them accountable. And so those are a few examples of the, the work that we've done broadly in education and, and kind of well-being. But now I'm going to move on to um, a program that we're calling uh, Well at Work, which again is being funded and supported by McConnell's Well Ahead Foundation. Uh, so whenever we work on a project at the Behavioral Insights team, uh, we again love to use a an acronym, which we call TESS. So the first thing that we do is uh, try to define what kind of behavior we're trying to change and what is the behavioral goal. The second step, which I think is really crucial, is to understand the barriers to that goal and to really do some explore work. So we don't want to base our interventions or solutions on any kinds of, of assumptions that we may have. Um, so I'm not Canadian, I'm not a teacher, and so it's really important for me to understand the local context, the provincial context, before I can come up with any ideas that I think may be effective. And then from our explore work, we develop a long list of solutions, which we then test not only uh, for a sense check with our partners, but also with a wider consortium that are made up of teachers, principals, and superintendents to see which ideas seem most feasible and likely to be implemented. And then we finally do a trial, which again is a randomized control trial, um, which I'll explain again in the future. And, and then ideally we would take these ideas if proven to be successful or impactful um, to scale. 
So see how we could scale these across multiple provinces or countries. So the challenge that we were uh, given, which is uh, not small, was how to increase whole school well-being. So this meant not just focusing on teacher well-being, but focusing on support staff, principals, and everyone in between. Um, so we really wanted to make this a, a whole school effort uh, because we believe that well-being has to you know, focus obviously on the individual, but the school climate plays such a huge role um, in well-being and in the support of their staff. So we wanted to make sure that everyone was included and, and thought very carefully about. So what we did in the first phase of our Explore activities, the first thing were uh, phone interviews. So we conducted uh, five semi-structured interviews with some leading academics in the field just to understand a bit more about the literature, what's been done and, what, and what's been uh, successful in the past. Um, I think quite surprisingly to us, there have been a lot of activities that I'm sure this isn't surprising to you around how to increase student well-being. But there's been less of a focus on how to increase uh, teacher support staff and principal well-being, which I think is a huge area where we need to focus on and especially focusing on how can we increase whole school well-being. And so those interviews were very insightful in giving us a more academic background to uh, what kinds of solutions we might be able to come up with. The second thing that we did was a, uh, I think, about a 14 day visit to uh, British Columbia. So myself and a colleague went and we ended up doing some field work. So we were able to sit in, observe classrooms, uh, tour a variety of different schools, and then conduct interviews with around um, 25 principals, administrators, teaching and non-teaching staff, and also speak to school districts to really understand what were some of the initiatives that were already happening and what were some of the kind of unique stressors and enabling factors uh, towards their well-being. And then of course, we did uh, some pretty in-depth desk-based literature review to see again, what's already happening in this field and to ensure that we're not reinventing the wheel. So the findings from our Explore work uh, really fell into three different categories. Um, we found that the main stressors were around workload, behavior management, and not being able to switch off. So you can see these are quotes from the, the qualitative work that we did. Um, and I don't think these will be surprising to you as, as people who work in education, but um, emails came up as something that was very stressful. So I get hundreds of emails every day. There's just so much information coming in at me. Behavioral management uh, challenges led teachers to ask if this was really something that was sustainable and that they could continue to do until they're 65. And then not being able to switch off, I think, was a really, really big theme that came out. Um, you know, this is a job that's hard to be, to not be here for, and that you're always thinking about your kids, even when you leave the office uh, on your drive home, you think about this at night, you often work late into the night to prepare for lessons. Um, and so I think these were some of the, the main stressors that we found from our Explore work. The good news is there were also some uh, enabling factors that we found that led to increased well-being. So um, educators, principals, and support staff cited that the, the big things that made a difference to their well-being in, uh, were interactions with kids. So feeling like you make a difference really helps stop the burnout. And um, support from other educators was a huge, huge finding as well. So I think our best support is each other. For me, it's all about the connection. So really re being able to rely on those people within your school um, as a support system seemed to come out as a very strong finding. Uh, and then finally, collaboration came out as a very key theme. So when asked what one thing they would do to change to improve school well-being, a lot of people mentioned increasing collaboration between teachers and in between classrooms. So after our Explore work, we moved on uh, to developing some solutions. And I, I want to be really careful in how I portray this because 
BITS aims to identify really small, uh, kind of small scale, low cost intervention ideas that can work within the existing uh, constraints of the system. So in this trial, we're working across three provinces who have different policies, different mandates and different funding. And a lot of times while we would love to change structural things that I think are very important and need to be addressed, this is not the role of the behavioral insights team. While we do make um, we do make every effort to bring this to policy makers' attention that they need to make structural changes, um, we try to focus again, work within the system and see what we can do to try to make an impact on well-being. So the criteria uh, that we that we think about is that it has to be able to be tailored. Um, the intervention needs to be multi-purpose to fit administrators, teaching, EAs, uh, or teacher support staff, non-teaching staff. So again, this is a, a wide variety of different populations. So we need something that can fit all of these populations. We also are really conscious that we're focusing on increasing well-being and reducing burnout. And so we didn't want these interventions to add any kind of significant burden uh, or increase workload. Uh, and again, we're working across three provinces. And so we needed to make sure that these would be applicable across varying cultures um, from over 160 schools and three provinces. And then finally, as I kind of mentioned, focusing on what we can actually feasibly change. Um, and so therefore many of these structural changes were outside of the scope for, for this project. So not necessarily an easy mandate, um, but we were able to come up with some solutions. So we, we proposed around 10 solutions uh, to do well ahead and also some of our uh, kind of trusted advisors. Um, I won't go through all of them here, but you can kind of read some of the ideas that we had in mind. And um, the three ideas that we decided to move forward with were to emphasize uh, gratitude and sharing gratitude. This comes a lot from Adam Grant's work, um, that hearing gratitude from beneficiaries such as parents or students or principals is actually a really good way to boost well-being and motivation. Uh, I mentioned storytelling quite a bit already, but storytelling between teachers around either times that they've failed or times that they've felt insecure um, and, and how they can kind of promote a sense of community, I think goes a really long way in normalizing the sense that we're not all perfect um, and trying to really relieve some of that pressure and emphasize that we're not alone in this and that we're a team. And then the third thing that we worked on was uh, principal endorsement. So we, we thought that given that principals have such a clear and distinct role um, in how they support and create a uh, kind of conducive culture for well-being, we really wanted them to kind of give endorsement for teachers, support staff, and for themselves to switch off and to focus on their own well-being. So what this looks like uh, in practice, pre-COVID, uh, were the solution number one was a weekly well-being program. So the delivery mechanism was through text messages. Um, and you can see an example of a, of a text message here. But again, we focused on things like gratitude, storytelling, normalizing healthy practices, um, and also supporting healthy thinking patterns. So trying to prompt people to um, use proactive coping mechanisms. Uh, and we tried to keep these messages as kind of short succinct, and succinct as possible and to make them really action oriented. And in terms of how we implemented this, we co-created these weekly well-being prompts with a variety of different stakeholders. Um, and then we obtain consent from school staff to receive the messages. Uh, we selected a, a texting platform um, that we could send out messages weekly. And then we sent the text messages to the school staff. For the solution number two, which was the principal endorsement, the delivery mechanism for this was four emails that would go out um, from principals to all school staff throughout the duration of this trial. So we would draft these messages 
um, and they focus largely on uh, providing permission for wellness uh, fresh start. So we know from research around um, from Katie Milkman that fresh start, especially at the beginning of a new year, is a really good way to reframe and try to forget about any of those kind of mistakes that we might have made in the past and view this as a new opportunity and get excited about what we can improve upon in the future. Um, and then as you can see, number three was when COVID um, started to really ramp up. So we adjusted our messages to be related more to COVID-19 and mental health. And then our final me message is yet to be sent out, but this will be a message of gratitude from the principal uh, around all the amazing work that the educators have had to do um, in response to COVID and all the, the kind of changes that you've had to make. So again, the implementation for this was that we bit develops these email templates, but we think it's really important that the principals have the autonomy to adapt these to their own school culture. So they're able to do that and then they send out those emails. And um, in terms of what the trial design actually looks like, again, I mentioned this is a randomized control trial. So we had uh, 1,202 participants agreed to take part in this study from Alberta, Manitoba, and BC. And then we divided these into three separate groups. One group is the control group who receive an introduction message that has messages around um, access to mental health resources. Treatment group number one is the weekly well-being messages being sent. And then treatment group number two is a combination of uh, the weekly well-being messages and the principal endorsement messages. And in order to measure the effect, we took baseline survey measurement at the very beginning to see what people's baseline measure of well-being and burnout were. We took a midline survey uh, in February, and then we'll take an endpoint survey uh, June 20, uh, June 2020, I think is the year. <laughs> um, and so that will allow us to see if there has is a significant difference between those who received messages uh, and those who did not in terms of their well-being and their burnout. And to give you just a quick sense of the outcome measures that we're collecting. Uh, we're focusing on two primary outcome measures. The first is well-being. And so if you're interested in this, it, we're using the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Well-Being Scale. We're asking questions like, how often have you been feeling optimistic, useful, and thinking clearly? And burnout, which are questions around if you feel worn out or emotionally exhausted at the end of the day, and if you feel burnt out. And we have some additional questions that we've added um, as well. So that's kind of a very brief overview of the program of work that we were doing um, pre-COVID. And then I just wanted to really um, give you uh, how we've responded to COVID-19 in light of um, everything that's been going on. So obviously it very quickly came in, uh, in in our attention that we needed to update these messages so that they were appropriate and relevant for all participants and, and that they struck the right tone. So we've been updating our messages to reflect this kind of new reality and we're refocusing our messages on uh, more so on coping during crisis. So one of the biggest things from the literature is really trying to build self-efficacy. So in a world of increasing uncertainty, um, we try to prompt people to think about the things that they can control and, and focus on those. Um, and again, trying to kind of break down your massive to-do list into smaller, more achievable steps. Um, and we're also trying to do more proactive coping mechanisms such as mindfulness. Um, also another really good mechanism for that is just reaching out for social support. And we've been trying to, again, remind people that it's okay not to be okay and to try to ask for help when they need it. And if they don't feel comfortable asking for help from a colleague, we have links for them where they can call free crisis help hotlines. And, and then another one is to try to encourage work-life balance. And so trying to help people give them very concrete ways that they can try to switch off at the end of the day if possible without trying to place additional pressure on them. 
So we're reviewing these messages on a weekly basis to ensure that we're responding in real time to changes in COVID and changes to the learning environment. And we're also trying to run these by teachers uh, as much as possible. Uh, and then finally, updates to the principal endorsement letters. As I mentioned before, we updated one of the letters to reflect COVID and, and, and encouraging um, principals encouraging those to switch off as much as they could and to really, and more now than ever, it's so important that our educators are taking care of their mental health. Um, and the changes that we made were really just allowing more flexibility in how principals tailor the email and um, understanding that every school has a kind of different way that they like to communicate. And I think authenticity is really important. So we wanted to allow for them to do that. Um, encouraging virtual social support. So again, trying to keep those connections with your colleagues that we, we saw from the Explore work were so motivating and engaging, feeling part of a team is something that we often are missing while we're working from home. So we want to encourage people to reach out to their colleagues and check in with them as, as much as they can. Emphasizing self-care um, and again, reaching, if you don't feel comfortable reaching out for support, again, providing um, support that the school can give you either through EPA or mental health uh, crisis hotlines. So those were a few ways that we updated the principal endorsement letters. And, and then before I move on to questions, um, the Behavioral Insights team has been running a variety of um, what we call rapid communications testing to see what are the most effective messages that we can be sending uh, so that people can uh, kind of make behavior change in line with COVID. And a lot of this is related to things like hand washing and wearing masks, but I think this also applies more generally to how we communicate uh, important messages to uh, fellow teachers, students, our staff, uh, et cetera. And so one of the things that we've been trying to do is really remove all essential content, uh, sorry, non-essential content, and to use as few words as possible. So I know it's really tempting. There's a lot of amazing resources out there um, and a lot of tips, but I think that this can easily become overwhelming um, and prevent you from actually doing anything. So in our messages, we're trying to use less links and actually just give concrete really easy steps that they can they can kind of try to do that week and um, the second thing is making the target behavior clear and easy to understand so instead of this again re refers to self-isolating but we found that using stay at home is much better than self-isolate because it's easier to understand so wherever possible using language that's just clear um, and and easy to understand um, we found that adding social justice justification for behavior. Again, this relates a lot to um, staying at home, but we found that when we tested messages saying things like, it's your duty to protect others, um, outperformed messages that just said, stay at home. Um, and we've also found that the message is actually more important than the design. So a lot of the best performing messages that we've sent actually don't have pictures at all. They just have text. Um, and the, the next two are, again, giving clear evidence, so not, um, not contradicting the evidence that you're giving and, and trying to just give clear, simple, concise information. And the third thing, I th or, sorry, the last thing that I think is really important is that um, if you want people to pay attention to information, put the most relevant information at the top of your emails or your communications. Uh, because people are unlikely, if you're sending a very long email, people are quite unlikely to read all the way to the bottom. And um, so it's easier for people to recall information at the top and um, at, at the top of the list. So make sure that you're prioritizing what you want people to pay most attention to. So those are some of the kind of lessons we've learned for effective communication and a bit about the trial that we're running currently. And um, so now I promised 20 minutes of questions, which I think I just hit 140. Um, so now I'm going to open it up for everyone here to ask me questions. And my email address is here. If you have any further questions about the work that we're doing, um, I'm very happy to answer any of those.
Great. So I think the question mode has been enabled. I'm not seeing any questions at the moment come through. Um, I have a question here from Donna. Uh, excellent that we did randomization. What have you done to control other factors? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the purpose of doing randomization is that hopefully by having a control, um, we can, con you know, the control group are likely undergoing many of the same circumstances um, as, as the intervention groups. And so by having a control, we can actually drown out a lot of that noise from external variables, and which is why we, we have a control group. And um, Sarah, uh, you mentioned principal endorsement letters four times a year. That seems pretty low to me. Uh, why was that number chosen? Great question. And um, so we, again, are very conscious that one of the um, one of the key objectives of this was not to place any more pressure or burden, especially on principals. Um, and so we had a lot of discussions around what the kind of optimal amount of messages were, and we did land on on four messages. I think in in the future we'll be conducting qualitative research with principals to figure out if that was too little, too many, um, and to see if people actually remembered these messages. So I think we're open to iteration on this topic. Great. What's the scaling out plan? Um, great question, Gail. Thank you. Uh, so we are waiting to get results. We, we should have results from this study uh, towards the end of June. And then we will, uh, I guess it really depends on, on what kind of results that we find, but we are hoping if results are positive that um, there might be potential to scale this at a, a broader level. level. So I could see a scenario where we provide an extensive um, bank of text messages and perhaps train um, either well-being coordinators at a district level or at a school level to be able to send out these messages themselves. Um, yes, did we randomize across schools, district or within schools? Um, we randomized a, across schools and um, so we wanted to make sure that we weren't um, ha having any kind of contamination or spillover effects so randomizing within schools would would cause some significant problems so if some people got the messages while others didn't and um, there's a high probability that people would then talk about those so we randomized at the at the school level um, but I guess important to mention that we also stratified the sample so that we tried to have an even mix of um, districts being represented in both the control treatment one and treatment two groups. Uh, what process did you use to arrive at the 10 solutions? That's a great question. Um, so we, the process was based on the explore work that we did and then the extensive literature review that we did. So we tried to look at what are the evidence-based practices that have been shown to work or have some promise to work. And then we narrowed those down by using a feasibility and impact matrix to try to make that into a kind of 10 possible solutions. And then we ran those again by funders and um, teachers and educators to get a sense again of, are these feasible and taking into all of those factors I mentioned around um, making sure they weren't too time intensive um, and added additional burden. And so those were, those were the ways that we landed on the 10 solutions and ultimately the interventions that we, uh, that we chose. Um, so 
So, and at the beginning was 1,200 first wave respondents was how many did staff know these were actually written by leadership and do you have any qualitative questions? Um, so, the and at the beginning we've experienced um we've experienced quite a low amount of attrition um i can get you more specific numbers on on how many people have now opted out of receiving the messages um staff did uh so staff did not know that the messages were written by us but we did um we did encourage the leadership to actually really tailor these messages to fit their school culture. Um, and yes, we are conducting currently a series of uh, around 20 to 30 qualitative interviews to follow up on how this intervention re was received and how we could make this um, more impactful moving forward. And if, especially if there were any kind of messages that a either really stood out and resonated with people or if there were any messages that kind of struck the wrong tone. And um, principals and staff need to feel connected. Is there any thought of staff being encouraged to, to send support emails to principals or is that left to the superintendent? That's a really, really great question and um, amazing point. Uh, for the purpose of th this trial, we we did not do this, but I think that would be an amazing add-on because I agree with you that um, principals oftentimes can feel disconnected um, and experience a great burden of stress, especially when trying to set a school culture of well-being amidst COVID. So um, yeah, that's a great point. Right. How many people? Um, how many people completed the baseline versus midline? Uh, I can show you the numbers. So, two thousand one hundred and seventy-eight completed the baseline survey. Uh, out of those people, one thousand two hundred and two opted into the trial. And then out of those one thousand two hundred and two, we had a total of. 245 respond to the midline survey. Does sorry, does that help answer your question? Uh, yes, great question about um low response rates. Um, I think this is something that we typically see. We normally account for in any kind of trial at least 50% uh, attrition in response rates um, and especially at midline um, at midline surveys. So the purpose of the midline survey was actually mostly to detect if there were going to be any backfire effects. So whenever you're dealing with something like mental health or well-being, safeguarding is our top priority. And so we wanted to run this analysis to see, was this making people's mental health or burnout uh, worse? And if so, we would have considered stopping the trial. We did not see that kind of effect. So we continued with the trial. Um, and for the endpoint survey, we will take more extraordinary measures to try to make sure that people are filling out the surveys. Um, and so, yes, response rates are always going to be lower than you want them to be. Um, midpoint doesn't matter as much as the endpoint surveys do though. Um, I think if we want to be able to learn more about what you find out, where should we be keeping an eye out? Great question. Um, so this will hopefully be published academically. Um, we're working with the University of Toronto as an academic partner, and so that might take a while, but hopefully we'll be able to write um, some, some blog posts about these kind of findings, and then the findings should be able to be shared with the participating school districts ahead of academic publication. And 
And so this, for clarity, this program, is this a program school buys or the school board purchases? Uh, neither. So this was offered for free to all schools and school boards. It was funded by the uh, Well Ahead Foundation. Uh, uh, yes, we um, we would love to include more provinces such as Ontario. Um, and I think that would be part of if this after we see the results, we would love to scale this, uh, you know, across Canada if possible. Um, and obviously to other places like the US. And So, uh, love the messages. Thank you, Curtis. Um, how may I access the past ones and any that you draft in the future? And um, so as this is an ongoing trial, we're not able to share those messages yet, but hopefully um, after we get, we get the results, we would love to make these freely available for other schools to use if possible. Uh, Donna, I think it would be very important to know why those that do not respond on their midpoint choose to do so. Um, yes, I, I definitely agree with you. Um, it could be a multitude of factors. I think um, we we need to probably, so the, the kind of measures that we're trying to take to ensure endpoint uh, completion is uh, influence this the survey coming from an influential messenger to try to increase uptake. We also um, are able to offer incentives to schools. So for every person who fills out the survey, we can donate a certain amount of money to charity or to their school. And um, and so we are trying to to come up with more kind of innovative ways to make sure that we get a higher response rate for those endpoint surveys. Uh, the interview and evaluation questions. Um, so I can share on the slide um, here. These are the these are some of our outcome measures. The interview questions. Um, could you clarify? Do you mean the interview questions that we asked originally, or uh, would this be the interview questions that we plan to ask for the follow-up qualitative work? And if not, feel free to feel free to email me separately about that topic. The original um, interview questions. And we need to check, um, but if you email me separately, I can uh, look into that and share the question and hopefully share the questions that we did ask. Great, it looks like we have six minutes left. Um, any other burning questions that I can respond to? Uh, would we be anticipating any sort of differences in results between provinces? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I I imagine that we would we would anticipate probably some differences between provinces. Um, as you guys all know, and as I've come to learn, uh, provinces are very different, um, and so we'll be doing a province le level um, data analysis to see if there were significant differences between Alberta, Manitoba, and BC. Um, Sarah, so all teachers were invited to this. What do you think the primary things teachers should take away from this presentation. Um, I mean, I think hopefully um, that your well-being matters um, and that uh, 
there are, are you know, so I think the, the kind of last slide on how to communicate effectively um, with whether that's with staff uh, are, are some really key takeaways. But I think one of the things that um, I'm really passionate about, I started working um, originally with on student well-being, but I realized very quickly that um, teacher well-being is, is a huge priority. And I think teachers are continuing to focus. I've I've been searching high and low for teacher stories on how COVID-19 has been impacting their own mental health and how they're coping with it. And it's been really hard to find. And what I've been finding is it's actually how teachers are continuing to support the mental health and well-being of students, which I think is very important and admirable. But um, I would hope that you take away from this that you guys are, you are all human too, and that you're doing an amazing amazing job uh, amidst a lot of uncertainty and so um we would i would actually if any of you have stories um that you would like to share on how you're coping or not coping that's that would be really really helpful for me to hear and um, because i think it's, it's a really important topic that we share more widely Right, so I think I think we only have three minutes left, and I'm very conscious of everyone's time. But um, I really do encourage you, please, to to reach out to me um, if you have stories that you want to share. Um, of course, these if you were willing for these to be shared um, in subsequent messages that go out to teachers, they could, they would be de-anonymized, and we we wouldn't use your real name or where you're from unless you wanted us to. Um, but this is all to say thank you for the amazing work that you're doing. I'm constantly impressed by educators all over the world, um, but you guys are are real heroes to me, um, and it's been so inspiring to work on this project. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me ramble on a bit, um, but hopefully some of this was helpful, and, and feel free to email me um, any questions that you have.